a o te rā kia ora tātou, a mōre nā rā kia kōtou e whakarongo e tītiro mai ana ki tēnei. Kā nui ngā mihi hoki ki a kōtou e noho haumaru ana i te kāinga. O te rā, hei te tūatahi, me kara ki a ai tātou, hei whakatū whera hoki i tā tātou i nei kōrero i tēnei rā. Manawa mai te mauri nuku, manawa mai te mauri rangi, ko te mauri kaiau, he mauri tipua, ka pakaru mai te pō, tau mai te mauri, tau mie, hui e, tā i ki e. Ana kia ora tātou. So welcome, welcome everybody to today's session. And we have with us Professor Leon Tihama and also Professor Linda Tuhiwai-Smith. Unfortunately, Matua Papa Graham is unavailable at the time, but hey, that's okay, we still carry on. O tira tēnei rā te mihi atu ki a kōtou, he mihi aroha, he mihi mai oha hui hoki tēnei kia. Kia koutou katoa. Kei a koe te wai nā e nei, Leoni. Kia oda, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou e mātake tau he mai ana i tēnei wā. Tautukau nā mihi kia tātou katoa, e noho haumaru ana i tēnei wā. Mai reo da ki a tātou katoa. Ka whakaaro hoki ki ngā tangata whenua iwi taketake o te ao i tēnei wā. Ko te tūmana koka noho ora atu koutou, me o koutou whanau hapu iwi tēnā koutou. So, morning, and it's our second session, kōrero, kōrero tū, for this session in terms of kaupapa Māori theory and methodologies, and just really wanting to support the karakia this morning, and really just saying, because I know a number of our Indigenous relations are watching this internationally, that the karakia that we do uh, here really uh, is a karakia for the ao, for the world, for all of our relations and for everyone around the globe who's experiencing, um, you know, the impact of COVID-19 um, and wishing uh, wellness and health to all of you and all of your people um, at this time. So we wanted to know the follow on uh, from uh, Friday's kōrero uh, with Graham, where Graham talked about some of the origins of the development and kind of evolution of Kaupapa Māori theory out of Kaupapa Māori spaces, particularly out of uh, education, Māori educational initiatives that were developed in the 80s, and, and remembering that there is also a history that came before that development uh, of Kura Kaupapa Māori and Kōhanga Reo, um, of you know, activism, one of the things that Graham really reminded us of is the 80s was really a revolution of the mind and that manifested itself in the ways in which we then worked as Māori to remove ourselves from the education system and to develop our own systems and key people that led those movements on behalf of all of us, really, uh, to revitalise and regenerate Te Reo Māori, Māori language, Tikanga Māori, our practices and protocols and mātauranga Māori, Māori knowledge and ways of knowing. Um, so we wanted to start, Linda, with you today, really kind of going back into that space for a little while, um, because the work you've done around decolonising methodologies has has also been grounded, has, is grounded in Kaupapa Māori in that time. And really after Graham's session last week, maybe we could start with you sharing some of your reflections on that time, the, particularly in the development of... Uh, Māori educational initiatives and some of the experiences, because I've heard in the past, I've heard you talk about some of the experiences that you had as a group uh, as you went up um, against, really, and resistance to the existing system, education system. So I thought it'd be good to maybe start with that to give a kind of grounding from that period and then move into talking about decolonizing methodologies and Kaupapa Māori methodologies. Mm. Uh, okay, um, kia ora everyone and um, hopefully people are all hanging toe with their um, isolation and um, thriving and enjoying it, actually gaining some enjoyment out of it. Uh, yeah, it's interesting reflecting back on uh, 
uh, the 1980s period because I think it was quite revolutionary in that sense of, of this um, radical change of mindset. And remember, the decade before that was really the decade of a lot of political activism. So there was a lot of rhetoric about change. But what Kohanga Reo did and what some of our um, sort of employment-related programs, a lot of these initiatives that had been put in place started to demonstrate was our ability as communities to actually just pick up and do things ourselves. Um, I think it was also a time of great confidence, so a belief that um, we really had the opportunity to not only do things ourselves, but change, change the law about what we did. Uh, that was important. But what I take away from that uh, period, you know, on reflection, is a lot of what we learned um, about how, how change happens in, in our particular community. So, for example, um, I was always interested in why some parents chose to essentially step off the cliff and take a punt with kura kaupapa Māori and why some parents could not. You know, and I've learned not to judge, make any judgment uh, about the ones who could not, but to try and understand the tendencies, the motivations, the things that drive us. Uh, because actually the ones who came along uh, were a mix of parents, some were, who were very well educated in one sense, and then there were others who came along because they knew, they totally knew that the status quo was never going to work for their children because it had not worked for them. They, they totally understood that. But then the other scary thing is they had total trust in us being able to deliver something and they were prepared to come on that journey and they never wavered. Once could have got established, it attracted another group of parents. And I think another thing we learned then was um, the power of um, this sort of taken for granted idea of education. So some of the parents who came in were like, well, what time does school start? Does it start at nine and finish at three? What time is playtime? You know, do you have a bell? I remember we had a whānau hui about a bell because one of the fathers reckoned we needed a school bell. And we're like, where'd you get these ideas from that education is, is about those things? But it was clearly them wanting uh, a kura to look normal. Even though we're trying to tell them, no, we don't want to be normal. Normal's terrible. Normal is what killed our language. Let's try and be different. But how scary that concept was. So there was always this tension. You know, another tension was with our kayako. So we had a mix of trained and untrained ones. And Tuki ne Nepe and others said, you know, some of these trained teachers have been in the system a while, are deeply colonised, and so we need to have our own teacher training programme to train our own teachers from scratch. Uh, because they had all these ideas about levels, for example, that their reading levels, they need to be at this level and that level and this level. But actually, Te Reo Māori resources um, weren't and still aren't leveled in that sense. Because a child can, once they unlock or decode reading in Te Reo, they can read anything. Whether they understand what they read is a different issue, which is the, the level of complexity of ideas and comprehension in that. But they can decode a word. Uh, once they've mastered it. So there was the, this need then to retrain teachers. So the more we experienced developing a kura, the more, the deeper we got into the education system, needing both to kind of assert a kopa of Māori over curriculum, maths teaching, reading teaching, the concept of teaching, ideas about learning, ideas about assessment, every part of what counted as education needed um, us to pay attention to it. 
you know, and I, I think that's really important when we're thinking about system change. We can't just change the external walls of the system. It's actually deep system change that um, you have to do, otherwise you don't really transform anything. You just transform the external, the pretty bits. You know, you put Māori art on the walls, uh, but you don't, don't change the way of thinking. Um, we, we had some powerful conversations with parents. Um, one of the ones that really stuck in my mind is when we asked our parents, what kind of child do you want our kura to produce? When they've finished kura, what kind of children do you think they'll be? What kind of human beings? And, you know, they wanted them to be loving. Uh, they wanted them to be um, kind of, you know, they talked about having a Māori heart and a Māori mind. You know, they wanted them to have the real, but they also wanted them to have English. They wanted them to access the world. They wanted them to, to learn a third language. And they're like, they were really open-minded and had big dreams. But they did want a different kind of child out of our schooling system. And we worked hard in the early days to realise that. And actually, we very quickly came to realise it when we started accepting children who had been in the mainstream for a while because those children definitely came with a particular kind of attitude, um, which they needed, you know, they needed to be embraced in this love, the love of the kura community, um, but same as our kaioko. So for me, that period of establishing a, a kura was about learning some of these deep fundamentals of education, why education is powerful, and the... Um, the degrees to which the system itself supports itself to thrive. And I think, you know, that's where the probably my ideas about decolonizing kind of come in because it's, it's really trying to understand how you kind of pull each of those components apart um, without the thing collapsing. I mean, that's the other really important point to make is we were creating a kura but going to kura every day. So in other words, we had to have a stand-up program every day. We had to have the trust of our parents every day. We had to excite the tamariki every day so they wanted to come to kura, which they did. They wouldn't go home at night. Um, and at the same time, sustaining a viable program and trying to change it. And I think that's a lot of what we try to do as a people. We're trying to change things while we live, uh, try and live in a good way. You talked about, um, just on that point around Kaupapa Māori across the board, Kaupapa Māori and cu curriculum, and also Kaupapa Māori is foundational. So, um, and immediately I started to think about, so how, how did you come up that founding, those founding people? Uh, come to the point of developing Te Homatua. So I think Te Homatua is probably one of the, apart from Tuki's work, um, least talked about in the broader educational sense. It's something that our whānau, you know, kaioko and, and those involved in kura do and whare kura do every day. Um, but how, what kind of pushed that group of people to actually making the decision to write and develop a clear philosophy for Kura Kaupapa Māori? Um, the short answer is we were forced to um, out of what we call the Tomorrow Schools Reform. And we had been arguing um, as a group of Kura parents across the country that we wanted our own category in the legislation called Kura Kaupapa Māori. And I, I think the... Um, Director of Education at the time was Dr. Maris O'Rourke. So, you know, what they kept pushing back on us um, was, well, you know, you don't, the tomorrow schools reforms, all kinds of schools are going to be involved, but what's so special about you? And, um, you know, we, we kept asserting our specialness, but she insisted and so did the reform 
the reform leaders, if you like, insisted that um, we make a statement about this. So we were given 10 days to write essentially a document which said why we were different. And I mean, Te Matua is a very profound example of really what we had to do um, that, that not only showed how we were different to the mainstream, because that's, you know, that was kind of easy to do, but what we stood for educationally. And, okay, so Te Matua was written by real human beings. It wasn't passed down to the kura from the mountains. It's not a mystical document. It was written, I would say, over a four, five-day period uh, in Whaingaroa at Katarina Mataira's home where about 12 people gathered and um, sat down there and said, right, we've got to write this document by Friday. Uh, what is it where, you know, what's in it? What's so special about us? And, you know, some of the ones who were in that were like uh, Pim Bird, uh, who was at uh, Mako Manga, I think, uh, Tuki Nepe, obviously, Graham, um, you know, some from around the country. So they really just knocked it off as a document and sent it in and said, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. Um, this is what's special about us. And so Te Ahumatua became the guiding philosophy, really, of kura kaupapa Māori. I mean, alongside the structural changes, so you were talking about decolonising methodologies, kind of coming out of that and thinking around how we continue to live while we're deconstructing and trying to build at the same time, which is what we're doing all the time. Um, so what was the kind what were some of the kind of reactions you had from the system itself from the ministry itself uh, in terms of even pro, um, so th like the naming of kura kopa for uh, even on the fundamental level of naming i understand there were critical things meetings that happened um, so what were some of those kind of ways that you pushed back at the system mm. during that time? Well, I mean, that's a really good example because what the system kept coming, but, you know, so the system at the time was the Department of Education, not the ministry that we have now. And they would come and they would keep using this term about your, now about your bilingual school. And we go, no, we're not a bilingual school. Um, and, you know, we sort of had a meeting, uh, you know, about some of our, the, the difficulty we were having communicating really what we were about and the, the extent to which government and the, the department would just reframe everything we see to them and they'd come back with their own language and we didn't like their language. So, you know, at our meeting, the word came up, kura kaupapa Māori. We really loved it. We thought, yeah, we want this word on the lips of everybody. And we wanted to watch them struggle as they said it. And so we would go to meetings and they'd say, about your biling bilingual school, we'd go, no, we're a kura kaupapa Māori. And eventually they started to say, about your k k k kura, you know, and they would sort of fall over themselves and we had little private jokes about it because um, we, we really wanted to force them to name us the way we wanted to be named. Um, and a lot of that was about this power to define what we were on about and that our language had the power to do that. But we really had to assert it. We had to use it all the time. I mean, we had a very slick negotiating group of people and a slick negotiating strategy, I think, in terms of all our interactions. Because actually to change the law, uh, which is what we achieved, I, I would say maybe 25 of us all up. Um, and at a lot of our meetings, maybe five of us. 
But we would do things like we would take, there might be, in Auckland, I'm talking about Auckland, there were other groups in Rotorua and uh, Palmerston North around the country. But in Auckland, we would like take, there might be Graham, uh, Tuki Nepe, and there'd be one of our random parents who'd be breastfeeding and, um, you know, who we, even we would not know what might come out of her mouth. And we would be in a negotiation and then the, you know, the breast comes out, the baby is there, the official is getting increasingly uncomfortable with the breastfeeding mother um, while we're sort of hammering our points. And then, you know, some, a pearl of um, just pure grassroots wisdom would come out of her mouth at the same time, often with a few swear words inserted into it. And it would rattle um, the people we were talking with. It would really sort of shift them off their comfort zone. And we were able to um, take advantage of that. We always went in with written um, submission of what we wanted to achieve at any meeting we were at. We documented every meeting we were at. We reminded them every time what they promised us, what they said last time. And, and I think in those things, we were very careful, uh, very strategic. In the end, um, you know, the, the one of the key MPs in Auckland who helped us, who people might not think of, was uh, Phil Goff. He was the MP for Mount Roskill. Yeah. And what he did was help um, basically raise that in Parliament and talk to key people that enabled us to then proceed. You know, simultaneous to us doing this, uh, Peter Sharples was very active. Um, both he and I were on the Tomorrow Schools Reform Committees, different committees, and he was playing a very national uh, role at that point. Um, Tony Waho and others in Palmerston North. So we were not a nationally coordinated effort. We were efforts that were really genuinely emerging out of um, the flax roots of our uh, movement. But we did meet regularly and we met maybe twice a year. Um, and it was to agree to agree on certain key ideas because actually all the could at the time were very different and so what we had to do was just agree to agree on key areas and to let the differences just sit there it didn't matter the differences didn't matter you know and i would reinforce what graham was saying that and you know in the end the difference between the kurukaupa Māori movement and some of the kōhanga who are trying to establish schools, their own kura, like keep their children back in kōhanga, um, was that the kura kaupapa Māori movement ultimately wanted to change the law and wanted to normalise the idea of kura kaupapa Māori as a viable schooling option for the entire country. So in those, you, you know, when you talk about the naming, you talk about shifting the discourses and, uh, you know, reframing the way in which they understood things. So kind of around the same time in the 80s, you and Graham also entered into the other education department, the School of Ed, um, <clears throat> at the University of Auckland. And so, you know, when you're talking about others around the country taking on different roles, I mean, it was a key role that you both moved into at the time when Māori education was under a significant change. So, um, I mean, how did you see moving into the academy uh, as being something useful to the movement or contributing to the changes that you were a part of within the whānau of Kura Māori? Mm. You know, at the time when we were, our daughter was in Kohala, I was a um, teacher and then a guide counsellor at a major secondary school. So counterbalancing what we're doing in Kura, Kohanga was this kind of professional role I had, um, basically working with young teenage Māori girls who were falling through every crack in our system. 
So I would go at home at night really depressed. Um, you know, we had girls who, for whom living on the street was the best option that was available to her because it wasn't safe to live in her own home. Um, so, I, you know, so I had this other kind of nine to five life, if you like, where things were just coming undone for our young people that doesn't matter what we tried. And we, we did some fabulous things at our kura, but there was a group of young Māori who just were not faring well. So that was a kind of counterbalance then to uh, what we could see happening in kura. And I'll just divert it while I'll tell you another story. One of the things we had to do when we were in Kohanga is go to uh, basically the Department of Māori Affairs to get a little bit of funding. And we, as Kohanga parents, would be pitted against you know, all the social work um, communities, they wanted money for blue sniffing kids who lived under bridges in Auckland for, you know, every cause you can think of. And we were seen as um, idealist dreamers. We didn't know what we are talking about. We didn't have any evidence that, you know, what we were doing with this, these children would make a stick of difference. And, um, you know, it was in Ponsonby Road uh, uh, where, where, the, where the meetings were held and we'd go up there and, you know, and we were, it was like, do you fund with this $5,000 grant um, the worst case scenario of our people or do you fund this initiative which is about babies learning to do? And those two things were pitted against it other all the time and um, so we'd come away sometimes having nothing and then other times we'd kind of get a win and we'd think yay you know I really we were arguing about five thousand dollars from the government to help and you know that was the greater injustice but we're pitted against each other now that hasn't changed in a sense um, in a lot of, in a lot of our efforts so Sorry, that's a diversion. And now I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> it was around um, your, the work that you have done at the University of Auckland. And oh, yeah, University of Auckland. Oh, okay, yeah. So I think when we went to the university, I, can't, I think we generally um, went because we could see the power of education. Um, we could see, we understood its power to destroy, but we also could see the, the potential of education to transform. And so Graham and I actually applied for one job and we made the decision as a couple, as a family, that uh, we would do half a job each. And at the same time, Graham, um, had kind of given up or gone half time at his other position at Auckland Teachers College to teach at the Kura. So we were kind of living on a one salary, 1 1.5 salary up and down, but um, we accepted, we were offered a senior lectureship in education, um, 0.5 each, and we saw it as a real opportunity to. Um, kind of influence these key ideas about education that we had been butting against in our work. Um, because every time we did, you know, argued for things, even when we were teaching, it always came back that, you know, the authority of research, the authority of theory, you have no theory for that. There's no evidence, there's no research. And that's what we were up against all the time. And so we thought, you know, damn this, there's no research because you don't want to do the research. There's no theory because no one's wanted to theorise our experience. And, um, you know, I think that's a huge motivator for why we were prepared to uh, start at the University of Auckland. But I think also we lucked out 
in that it was, I suspect, the golden era of education at the University of Auckland, and that we had these opportunities. Uh, partly, I mean, they weren't handed to us on a plate. We had to think very strategically and act very strategically all the time. We had constant battles with our colleagues. Staff meetings were like, um, you know, dreaded, but really important opportunities for us to win resources, to win arguments, um, which meant going very prepared. And that was one of Graham's um, real strengths as he, you know, strategized every meeting. I'd get wild and want to leave the room, but he, you know, he would basically ground them down, ground our colleagues down, and, and rather than have an argument with, with him, they'd kind of let them win. Uh, but it meant we were able to grow the number of positions we had really rapidly. We also had a different philosophy in, you know, Indigenous and Māori colleagues in the university because unlike the normal pattern um, where you start at the bottom, you know, you think, all right, we'll do a course at 100 level and then we'll do another course at 200 level. We went in and said we want to do a master's course and we want to do a, like a 300 level bachelor's program. And they were not prepared for that. Our colleagues were prepared for us to do little insert lectures in their courses. You know, for us to do a one hour lecture, or there would be visitors all the time. And uh, we had said to them, no, we're not visitors into your programs. We want to change your programs and this is how we're going to do it. But by targeting the master's level, we were able to bring back into the university, you know, lots of Māori who we knew had first degrees. You know, many of the ones who are out there teaching, uh, we were able to pull in. But we were also able to kind of attract up into... Um, you know, the 300 level of education, students who were sitting in our undergraduate courses but not really seeing a future for themselves. So that's where we started our teaching and then we went down and up. So we sort of ploughed down into the undergraduate program to influence that and then we also developed a really probably the largest master's program in the country at the time in Māori education. We changed the degree structure from a master's of education to a master's in Māori education, I think it was. So it was very, you know, one of the reasons we really wanted to do that was to get into the research and theory space, we really had to claim the research and theory space. And to do that, we had to be in the graduate uh, area. And we both understood that we had, you know, I was doing my master's degree. Graham already had a master's degree. Um, and it seems such a long time ago now to look back. And, um, but no one else was doing it. We were the first in the country to be teaching Māori education at university level. Uh, the courses that we designed really were influential. Uh, those first era students like you, Leone, that came through were really influential. And people never believed. They didn't believe we could have a master's program of 50 students. And I remember, I've got photos of a conference we had of all our master's students. And we invited Joanne Archibald from Canada and Marie Batiste and others to participate. And, you know, it was the first time people could see these actual real bodies of Māori students who were completing their master's um, degrees. And then that was our platform for then going on to the PhD program. So I just reinforced what Graham said last week that while most, you know, ordinary people may not see the struggle over theory, language and research, uh, particularly in the field of education, but in most professional spaces, that is a real struggle. And it is a, 
that is the struggle to define who we are and what our aspirations are. It's a struggle to legitimate what we're trying to do. It's a, it's a struggle to convince our own people of these things as well as um, others. So, you know, to me, it's a, a real struggle and it has not ended. During that time, um, you were also instrumental uh, in developing a number of research institutes. And I, I think that this is a part of the kind of build you were doing to decolonizing methodologies earlier. So the Research Unit for Māori Education and then IDI, the International Research Institute for Māori and Indigenous Education, which was a first of its kind as well. Um, what was, uh, you know, as critical kind of events, those establishment of those, how do you see that they help to build some space in the research space, in the methodology space for Māori? Well, I think, well, firstly, we started with our research unit of Māori education, which was essentially us. I think there was uh, you, Graham, uh, Trish Johnson, Māori Hohepa, Kuni Jenkins, and a who are a few other colleagues, but it was a way for us to work as a collector and to really strengthen our ideas and then to provide support for our students in doing their research. I think the powerful thing we did in RUMED was to um, see every thesis that was completed as a publication and to kind of disseminate that as research and to really kind of build our confidence in ourselves, build an idea that as a group, we can do this as a group. And then, um, you know, we were housed in the Department of Education at the time. Uh, we didn't really have much resources, but we had a lot of creativity, a lot of energy, um, and real belief in ourselves to do that. At the same time, it helped us academically in our own careers. So it gave us a lot of internal credibility that we were doing research, supporting graduate students doing their research. With uh, EDI, the International Research Institute, I think that was um, for Māori and Indigenous education, that was a strategic step up. Uh, one was because we had already been moving around the Indigenous world and meeting up with other colleagues um, and seeing our work as not just about Aotearoa but as an international um, kind of network of Indigenous educators but also seen in the university the, the status levels and I think you know we decided as a collective we would develop this institute it was funny, uh, like we had to write all these proposals and I always tell the story, it came down in the end to the capital, a capital T. And, you know, because we'd been knocked back, every time we'd been knocked back and um, we just got more stubborn about it. And I, went, I had to go and see this dean and professor in engineering or something. And he was going through our really well-written submission, I thought, but he cottoned on to the fact that we had written the, with a capital T, the International Research Institute for Māori and Indigenous Education. And he said, the capital T, are you trying to be an independent legal entity? And I was, you know, I was like gobsmacked thinking, no, it's how you start a sentence with a capital T. He said, no, this is what the committee is arguing about, that you're trying to step outside and be a legal entity because that's what the capital T meant. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, like, foolish me. How come I didn't know this? But I don't know how many meetings we went to to argue for the title of our institute. We set up an international board. Um, the Dean of the Arts gave us a grant and we had a fantastic launching and then we had no more money. Um, but we invited people from all over the world and it was a step up. It was, you know, saying, 
you know, about Māori research, that Māori research is actually globally significant for other, uh, other contexts, that our researchers could foot it internationally and that our international networks could enhance the things that we're doing here. And it set us up off on a different track. Of, I mean, a, equally difficult because we did all these things with minimal resources. Our biggest resources, I would say, was commitment to a hope, energy, um, and our collectivity. That, that was, those were our resources. Not many dollars. Um, but from those resources, I think we, we've developed something truly uh, amazing because it then went on, you know, it became a platform to develop our pai o tamara matana. So pick up on the um, Indigenous international, international connection. And you, you mentioned Joanne and you've mentioned Marie Bitti, so Bob Morgan, there are others uh, that were really significant out of Hawaii, across the world really. Um, in, the, in the development, because we are going to come to the next question around the development of, the, of decolonizing methodologies as process and, and as a book. But what was the significance of those connections? Why were they important? Because I think it's really important for new generations of Indigenous academics to continue that kind of networking that, were, that was established during that period. What made that really important to the work overall or to the project overall? Because I think other Indigenous scholars were doing and experiencing exactly the same things that we were. Um, that we were able to support each other and learn from each other. That the solutions that we thought we had in New Zealand, uh, we could find that other people had solved some of those issues um, themselves in their own way, but that they were also borrowing and adapting things that they saw here in Aotearoa, especially uh, in, uh, in terms of at the time. There was a great deal of international interest. I think at a deeper, more academic level, um, for me, it, it also sort of deepened and enriched my own kind of understanding of how colonialism worked as a system across many different countries that had the same kind of outcome. So for example, education is a key tool of colonialism, but it got played out in different ways in different contexts. Um, a little bit softer at some at, in some ways here in Aotearoa because um, colonial officials had learned a great deal from what they'd done in Canada and the US. But the educational ideas behind um, colonialism kind of flow through these different contexts, whether it's South Africa, India, um, you know, Canada and the US. And we were part of a wider system of um, imperialism and colonialism. We were a small part of it. Obviously, we experienced it in uh, particular ways but it helped kind of complicate my understandings of it, um, of how it worked as a system, and, uh, and um, I guess deepened my sense of what it is we need to address, how deep these ideas um, go. So the internet, to me, the international work is really significant. In education, in, you know, um, in the field of education, the international community's always been important because ideas circulate, ideas flow, and educational ideas uh, that we often think came out of New Zealand did not. They came out of other places and they're imported to New Zealand and we then have to adapt them. And that's really the New Zealand way 
They don't really look at what we do well here in the Māori area and say, oh, let's scale this up. They go to Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, Sheffield, um, and they say, oh, look what they're doing to all their um, migrant communities. That, that'll probably work with uh, Māori in New Zealand, not. But they then bring that back here. And so we're constantly kind of arguing against these programs. And I think um, what the international kind of work helps us do is influence the international field, uh, but also gain international credibility directly in a horizontal way for what we do here. The best example of this is Kohamaru. I mean, the take up of the ideas of Kohamaru around the indigenous world have been quite profound. So I want to move us now to um, the writing of decolonizing methodologies as a text. And, and um, you know, we know that the basis of it came from your PhD work um, in 96. And so really in developing out of the PhD uh, into the publication, what were your, what was your kind of ideas around or your visions for what that publication might do? I mean, clearly it's gone. The impact has been significant. It's been huge uh, globally, not just in the indigenous world, but in the research world. But at the time of kind of developing, why did you kind of see the need for that publication? Um, and, and what was your kind of ideas or visions around how it might contribute in terms of opening more space within research? or Māori and Indigenous thinking and methodological approaches. Yeah. Um, in, in a sense, the, 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 the book was the part of the PhD I couldn't, I wasn't able to do. I mean, my PhD proposal, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to do Māori health, Māori education. You know, uh, my supervisors, uh, Roger Dale and Stuart McNaughton said, no, you just do this bit. And so, I, you know, kind of parked all these ideas and as I was completing my PhD, I became more determined to um, tell this other story that, you know, that it's not just Māori who see themselves as the most researched people in the world. It wasn't just us saying those things, that everywhere I travelled, um, I heard the same ideas. And... And yet, you know, I didn't see any of that written. And so as soon as I finished my PhD, I kind of, I moved straight on to a book proposal. And I um, basically recast a, the first part of my PhD. I sort of cut that up quite a bit. And then thought, right, I want to tell this wider story um, about imperialism and colonialism. And then... You know, about the sort of indigenous kind of story of revitalization. And I also wanted to tell a story that um, it's not so much anti research, but saying actually, if we go back into our own knowledge, we go back into our own stories, we value knowledge. Indigenous peoples value knowledge and we value discovering knowledge. We don't use those language necessarily. But we wouldn't be here if we just bumbled around, you know, which is what the literature kind of assumes all the time, that Native people just lived a static life, didn't learn, didn't find things out, didn't adapt, didn't create technology, had no literacy, were unintelligent, unimaginative. That's what the literature was saying at the time. Or if it didn't say it, that's what it implied, that we were incapable you know, of anything, of any thought, any rational thought. We were illogical. We were completely insane. That's what the literature implied. So I wanted to tell this different story. I thought it was a story other people would um, appreciate. I had no vision that, like here in 2020, I'm busy finalising the manuscript for the third edition. I didn't write it for non-Indigenous people. I was very deliberate. I wanted to write for people like our students and our colleagues um, that I had been meeting. 
and um, and I still don't want to write, you know, my focus audience has always been clear. The other thing I also knew about our audiences is they didn't really buy books. And it's like, if you know your audience isn't into buying books, why would you write a book? Um, but that was like, okay. But I knew what our ones were into. They were into photocopying the photocopy that someone had got in a class. And that's what they were into. So I thought, well, the best way really to get this out was to kind of target it at, um, you know, at people who were researchers, people uh, who were going to teach. And bit by bit, it will find its Indigenous audience. I really thought it would find. Um, the audience. It's taken a long time to do that, uh, in a sense, but, and as you say, a lot of non-Indigenous um, scholars and researchers have also used it. It's, I think it's, um, you know, I get lots of feedback from non-Indigenous scholars about how transformative it has been of their thinking and their fields and disciplines. Uh, but I get more satisfaction that it has helped develop, you know, Indigenous research really around around the world. And it, when I travel to conferences, I just meet uh, people literally from every continent. Uh, and they, they email me things like, you know, it's changed my direction, it's... Uh, it's given me hope, it's changed my life, it's, um, well, you don't write a book, a book about research, thinking you would get those responses, uh, but I think it filled a niche at the time, and now there's probably 30 books on Indigenous research methodologies, and the emergence of Indigenous scholarship since that time has been amazing. Mm. I mean, I think within decolonizing methodologies, there's a, um, there, is, there is a hope because it is about reclaiming and taking a sense of being self-determining in our own work as Indigenous people, as our ancestors always have been, right? So with the critique of colonialism doesn't actually mean we have to sit in despair. And I think the book um, actually brings a lot of hope it also brings, in my experience talking to people about it, a lot of affirmation, that people feel affirmed that what they're doing, others are doing. And so they would have these moments of thinking, yeah, this affirms or this is what we're doing. And for the first time, I'm actually reading myself uh, in this book from this Māori woman scholar, even though they're not from here. Mm -hmm. But the resonation, the way it resonates with Indigenous peoples. Um, Generally, uh, researchers, you know, scholars, and community uh, that are doing decolonizing work. I'm not sure if anyone's ever asked you this, but I, I'm kind of interested because uh, next week we're going to talk about the, some future, future work, and uh, where we might go to. But if you were going to think about, in your own reflection on the book, takeaway points from the book. What would be some key takeaway points that you think come from the book? I think that Indigenous people, and so here in Aotearoa, Māori, um, are valuers of knowledge, are capable, can create things, can do things themselves without permission or approval uh, from other academic sources, that we can, um, by, by pursuing the things that we have to pursue, by acting in particular ways, we can practice our anatiratanga, that we can practice our mana motuhake by simply doing what our ancestors hoped we would do, really, that um, they left us messages that we would do, that we would 
um, fight on, that we would live on, that we would create on, that we would, um, you know, keep our identity strong, that would keep our relationships to the whenua strong. And it's out of those things that you grow, um, at, you know, or have an intellectual tradition. It's out, out of those values um, that you create the future, that we don't have to give up uh, on ourselves, that we don't have to assimilate ourselves into uh, Pākehā culture to be to, to survive, you know, I think, um, hopefully it's, it is a message that says we have to get on with the work, uh, that we have to act collegially, we have to see ourselves as part of a wider struggle of Indigenous peoples, uh, that we have to see in education the power to turn it to our own use, um, that we have to understand, I use the quote from Audrey Lord of the master's tools, I will never dismantle the master's house. And I, I actually find myself using it even more now because I think um, what I would emphasize is that people think the master's tools are generic tools, like they're just neutral, a tool is a tool and it's really about the intentions of an individual person about how they use a tool. Whereas I would argue, no, the master's tools in colonialism were very specific. They were targeted to destroy indigenous peoples. Residential schools in Canada were designed to destroy First Nations people. Um, you know, trying to destroy a language is trying to destroy people. These are very specific colonial tools. And hopefully what people learn is those tools will not lead to our manamo to haki. Those tools implicitly will destroy us. They won't work. So we have to go back to the tools we had before and we also have to design new tools. So the other part of it is seeing the future. And I think explicitly Consistently in the book, I do link the work that we do as scholars to the wider work in the Indigenous, you know, around the Declaration of Indigenous Rights and the wider uh, work in terms of the, um, yeah, the international Indigenous rights um, movement. And, you know, one of the reasons I did that is while I was doing my work, my sister Aroha, me was on the drafting of the draft uh, declaration for the rights of Indigenous people. So I was seeing, you know, and hearing from her what she was doing in, in this global movement, and she's remained in it, um, you know, moved on into biodiversity, into intellectual property. So, you know, seeing this kind of work that our rights and our activists are doing has been really linked to what we should be doing as scholars, that it's not a disconnect, that we actually have to support that work uh, with, our, with our work. We have to support their discourses. We have to uh, train people to help them do the necessary work of advocacy and activism, because we have to have that. Um, you know, there's one thing we've learned, we don't get things given to us on a plate. Things don't come easy. I mean, we're right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. Well, I just know if our iwi hadn't moved in and our hauora and other social service organisations, you know, weren't delivering care packages and kaumatua packages, weren't sort of monitoring who's coming in and out of some of our vulnerable communities, we would have been left alone again. Um, we would be isolated. We would be, you know, the time lag between what the government might say is happening and when it gets experienced by, um, you know, a komatu and tateko or someone in Rotoria, that's days and days and days. And we've needed our own people. And I'm really proud, you know, of my own iwi for stepping up and stepping into these spaces. Because without them, I know, you know, we, we would fall through the gaps. 
That's, um, <clears throat> yeah, one of the things we've been seeing has, uh, now we're on the pandemic and talking about that, um, you know, for, for a number of weeks, Māori um, researchers and scholars and uh, medical, you know, experts have been saying uh, that the way that it's been messaged <clears throat> is not actually being messaged again in ways that can be received or understood in many ways from, you know, by a lot of our community. That public health messaging has for many, many years not actually spoken to Māori. So when they talk about 70 plus, 70 and older stay home, but we know that for Māori communities, we're actually looking at the 50s and 60s uh, age group needing to do that. So we have to message it differently. So I, I am interested in your thoughts around this kind of idea that we're in now and, and how we can move now even to change up even more of that discourse at the moment and to challenge back some of the methodology. So one of the things in the stats, it took a number of weeks for any ethnicity data to show. Um, and the reason we want that as, as Māori and Pacifica people is for a particular knowledge around when it becomes community transmission, we know the communities that will be most transmitted through. Um, <clears throat> and yet, on the other hand, we see these stats around European which for me is uh, it's, it's a strange shift backwards, right? That we begin talking about Pākehā people as European and other. So even the way that the, the, the data has been talked about feels like a backward move in terms of the decolonising work we've been doing. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we're going to have a field day analysing what's, ha what's been um, kind of happening uh, to us. The, you're right about the messaging. You know, I was really um, taken by Megan Bang, who very early on, so she's a, a Native American scholar in, in the US, working at a Northwestern University in Chicago. You know, she early on said, when it's not about social distancing. You know, it's about physical distancing, social connection. And she was the first person I heard kind of flip it and reframe it in a way that started to make sense. I was also, I was also really curious, interested that the Ministry of Health were very quick to send out guidelines for tangihanga, for how we can change tangihanga, and, but not quick on sending guidelines on how we could service Komatua, you know, like, like the, um, the priorities in terms of the specific messages for, for us. Now I'm hearing, you know, there's deeper analysis by the mainstream media of, um, you know, people who don't have GPs, a lot of Māori don't really have access to a GP. Um, you know, that's only starting to, to come up now in terms of the, the way the story is narrating. What I would emphasise, though, and I think what we can take out of it and feel good about is the things that we say we um, value, our relationships, our uh, intergenerational concept of how relationships work, our value of uh, connectivity, our value of manaakitanga and aroha ki te tangata, that these are things that we say are really important to us. And then when you see them being demonstrated, you can't help but feel, yeah, you know, our people have got this in a deeper way than maybe other um, societies. And you know, other you can just look overseas for the kind of mess uh, that's been created. I mean, the other thing that I'm really kind of pleased about is the leadership. So the leadership of our Māori health uh, scholars, researchers, practitioners, in you know, creating a, a Māori pandemic response group. I just think that's awesome. I think that Iwi Leaders Forum have been um, kind of hammering 
um, the government as well in terms of resources. Um, I know here in Whanganui where I am that all the iwi have had to collaborate with all the other organisations that are specialists in social service to kind of work things out on the ground. It's kind of revealed a new, I feel like a new dynamic um, and a new complexity that there are multiple competing uh, post-settlement entities that exist in a region that are not designed to collaborate. And the only reason they do is because the power of the people in them to just default to whanaungatanga relationship building as being that's how the world works. So that's that's kind of interesting. And then my sister-in-law, Cheryl, and I have been talking about the concept of mana recently and the assertion of mana. So I've got a new term like imagined mana, where some people, some organisations imagine they have a mana that the people haven't actually given to them. You know, that, that there's these interesting dynamics happening underneath the bigger, more positive story. And I think, you know, that might come out later. So I just think we can take a lot of hope out of this um, in, a, in a number of ways. Having said that, I'm in a little bubble in Whanganui and I don't know what's happening in other areas around home, our homeless communities. Um, in the you know domestic violence space, apparently here the, the reported incidents have gone down. Um, those kinds of things. So I know there are going to be people whose bubble isn't great, and um, and 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 there's a silence about that, not hearing anything about it. But I know it'll be there. Kia for that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I want to too acknowledge the um, work coming out of the National uh, Māori Pandemic Group. And we're going to put the website on before we come off so that our people and others can, can visit and have a look at the work that they're doing. And also the you know, Māori researchers that are really, and, and clinicians that are um, doing the work now um, of their own accord, um, you know, Papadangi Reid and you know, Rhys Jones, others, uh, Andrew Spall is redoing really modelling for Māori. I think it's really important that we look at what the potential of what could happen. And others that are reflecting on um, what's happening in their communities, like Lance Sullivan, uh, O'Sullivan in the north, and putting, you know, some challenges in place to make changes there. So here we've got the, the Te Rōpū Whakakaupapa Uruta, which is a National Māori Pandemic Group site. Uh, that's online for um, brown people to to look at and see what's happening around the the country for Māori, um, and uh, you know there is I think Linda a lot of reflection. Um, the family, you know, in terms of family violence, there, there is an indication of a generally a an increase, uh, and so again acknowledging those at the front line who are doing that work, um, and what we need to do to kind of recover to, not to a normality, because as you see, right in the very beginning, for Māori there is not uh, this kind of standardised New Zealand normality that we live in. We, we live in um, a, you know, a constant frame of decolonising while trying to also be joyful and hopeful mm -hmm. and constructing new ways of doing things. Um, so I just wanted to you know, give you an opportunity for um, anything else that you might want to add, and then we'll hand back to Wetini, uh, who will close, do a wrap up and close the session. So I guess if we just come back to Copa for Māori, I just want to, for those out there young, you know, starting your research and, and thinking about how, how does this early period of Copa for Māori relate to what you're you know, might be struggling with now. I think in terms of the whakapapa of ideas, it's really important to know, um, 
to know a whakapapa, where, where ideas have come from and the context they came out of and then how those ideas have travelled and been adapted uh, over time. I know there are people who, you know, choose not to use kaupapa Māori and yet everything they do kind of indicates that uh, they're working in a similar way and so I guess I have some things to say about that. Um, I think naming what we do as Kaupapa Māori has been really strategically important. Uh, it's been important in terms of Indigenous methodologies. It's really well cited as an Indigenous methodology. Um, but it's also about, you know, being clear about what we stand for. Um, and being clear and unambiguous about um, the things that are important to us. Because if we compromise from the get-go, we, we're compromised. Whereas I think if we kind of start with a really good, strong platform that puts us in charge of a kaupapa, then we're able to pick and choose the things that work for us and that go beyond maybe how we might originally um, have thought, thought things through. It comes back to our key ideas and values, which I think are still highly relevant today and some are more relevant. You know, I've been thinking about um, research ethics again more recently because you know, that was one of the first things that we really had a go at was um, the failure of research ethics to protect Māori and to protect Indigenous peoples. And then, you know, I've just kind of assumed um, people have got on with that. There's quite a lot of Māori writing about e ethics, but things have come up, you know, now recently, which suggests to me, oh my God, we're going to have to go back and revisit that. It's the same with the treaty. You know, we're having to go back now and reteach it to undergraduate students. We can never take for granted um, these powerful things that we have uh, at our fingertip, at our fingertips. Um, we have to keep educating. We have to keep um, really ploughing them back into our stories, so that it um, the momentum of it drives us forward. You know, otherwise we keep, we'll, we'll go a decade and then we'll recreate the same wheel that was created the decade before. And I think our development is about getting more wheels, helping the motor go faster, you know, being able to think more uh, laterally, horizontally, creatively and in more indigenous ways and, and um, forge our own future because in the end I think this is about the future. Um, so yeah, on behalf of everybody, you know, just a huge, huge thank you very much uh, to the both of you um, for affording uh, some of your time. And I am very aware that a lot of our uh, following, um, a lot of them are doing PhDs. So um, the audio that's derived from these sessions is really, really valuable. Uh, not only to our, our tauira, but um, to everybody, to te ao Māori. So I guess I'm saying on behalf of te ao Māori, um, thank you both very, very much for your time. And yes, I'm going to say that, and I did. Um, and also, um, tautokoa hauinga ngā mihi kua mihia, i.e. E, e kōrua, um, especially to all our essential service workers out there um, who are doing an absolutely amazing job. Um, and also especially to all our uh, Māori haura providers throughout there, you know, um, digging it in and getting money done, helping our kaumātua, and everybody that's in need. So, yeah, just thought I'd um, send that out. So, i rungi tērā, kia kōrua hoki ngā mā reikura o 
kai papa Māori rangahau tēnei rā te mihi ati ahula. So, um, in saying that, um, me whakakapi hoki uh, tātou i tēnei kōrero mai, tēta, mai i tēnei karakia. Ko hi ati tātou i raru i te rangi Māori, te harikoa me te manawanui, haumi e, ui e, tā i ki e. Ah, kia ora tātou. Kia ora. Kia ora.